Hey guys, I'm your host Tara A. Devlin and welcome to this week's episode of Koobana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest book, Koobana Volume 12, is now out. Collecting even more of your favourite stories from the show, you can find creepy ghosts, abandoned buildings, haunted shrines, fascinating monsters, and much, much more. You can find that on Amazon right now, and help support the show at the same time. This week, we're looking at stories of terrifying visitations from the other side. First up, a young boy is told that if he doesn't stop being lazy, a man named Towa Towa-san is going to visit him. And you really don't want to visit from Towa Towa-san. But is he real, or just a made-up tale to keep kids in line? Find out in Towa Towa-san. Ever since I was a child, I've heard stories of a creature called Towa Towa-san. Towa Towa-san is someone, or something, you only see when you skip out on school or work, or when you're being lazy. Since long ago, he has lingered, or been trapped in, our hometown area, and apparently he visited my parents once or twice as well. Sorry to start the story right away with some strange sentences. Anyway, these are some of Towa Towa-san's characteristics. He looks like a regular old man. He appears before people who are being lazy or skipping out on school and work. It's not just children who can see him, but adults as well. And at first, he has a blank face, but the more you see him, the more his facial features develop. When I was little, I used to believe what I heard, but when I was in the third grade or so, suddenly it all sounded stupid. Ironically, it was also during the third grade that I saw Towa Towa-san for the first time. I think I was playing with a friend at the time because I couldn't be bothered to go to calligraphy class. Anyway, when I got back home, somebody was standing by the front door. Was it the postman? A salesman? I didn't know, but the clothes clearly didn't look like that. I wondered if maybe it was the neighbour, Nakanishi-san, who had come over to visit. Either way, the man didn't seem to notice me, so I said, Hey mister, what's wrong? As soon as he realised I was there, he hurried off. Eh? I was shocked, but when I think back on it carefully now, it's like his face was completely blank. And that was the first time I encountered Towa Towa-san. Even that night, I was still trying to figure out whether the man's face was blank or not. I was thinking about the stories I heard as a child about Towa Towa-san, but at the time I'd forgotten about the part where his face first appears blank, but then the more you see him, the more his features appear. Anyway, let's jump forward a bit. I didn't see Towa Towa-san again for a while after that, and when I was a high school student, I joined the volleyball club. But the other members bullied me a lot, so I ended up not going to school much. Parents back then weren't quite as understanding of these things, so mine got angry at me a lot, and once a week I was forced to have an interview with my homeroom teacher about things. And, well, the guys who bullied me were all honours students, and I wasn't, so... But that's another story. And, being the countryside, there would be all sorts of rumours going around if people saw me walking around during the day, so my parents made me stay in the house unless I absolutely had to go outside. I had no motivation to do anything, so I usually got up around noon, and then I'd play on my computer until late into the night. I was basically living the life of a neat. And this was when I had my second meeting with Towa Towa-san. I woke up one day and felt a presence in my room, and panicking, I dove under the blankets. I wondered if it was my parents, but if it really was noon, the usual time I woke up, then both of them should have been at work, and it didn't seem to be my grandmother either. Could it be a burglar who thought nobody was at home? That was all I could think of, so I readied myself and then peeked out from under the blanket there were feet. I could see what looked like an old man's hairy legs in shorts. 
I briefly saw what looked like a jersey as well, but then I stopped looking. I flashed back. Back to the third grade when I saw that old man standing outside my door. After only about 20 seconds, I was convinced it was him. It was Toa Toa-san. Honestly, I didn't care how Toa Toa-san got into my room. I was more concerned about the fact that he was real. He stood there for about 10 minutes or so, and next thing I knew, he was gone. But after that, I started seeing him far more frequently, like almost every day. I seriously debated whether I should tell my parents about it. I mean, it was trespassing, right? But I really didn't have a good relationship with my parents, and because we only spoke to each other roughly once a week, in the end I decided to not say anything. But then again, if I didn't say anything, then things would just get even worse further down the line. I woke up as usual the next day, and of course, when I did, I sensed somebody else in the room with me. Instinctively, I put my head under the blankets, and then peeked out. And, as expected, that old man was there again. There was no denying that seeing him there two days in a row was really creepy. Still, thinking about his blank face made it impossible to stand up to him, and in another ten minutes or so, he disappeared. A week or so passed in the same manner, and although I oddly got used to it, I knew it was nothing good. Like, I realised that Toa Toa-san wasn't a human. But when I remembered how he was supposed to appear to lazy people, those who skipped school or work, well it honestly made me angry that he thought I was just a lazy bum. Like, yeah, I was living like a neat and I wasn't the most upfront person around, but the reason I didn't go to school was because I was bullied out of it. He didn't even try to understand that. This was all the fault of my shitty parents and my shitty teacher. About a month passed from the first time I saw him in my room. I had a meeting with my homeroom teacher that day, and he was even harder on me than usual, which really pissed me off. I went to sleep in the worst mood, and when I woke up, there he was again. I was so annoyed by everything that, rather than diving under the blankets again, this time I got angry at him, and used some pretty colourful language. Look, I'm not lazy, okay? So for the love of God, stop coming here! If someone saw me yelling at Toa Toa-san, but they were unable to see him, they would no doubt thought that I was under the influence. And the more I yelled at him, the more I woke up and the better I could see. I realised that I was staring right at Toa Toa-san's face. There he was, as I expected, looking just like he did when I was a child. But his face wasn't blank this time. For better or worse, he looked just like a regular old man, but the blank expression on his face was oddly terrifying. As soon as our eyes met, he immediately left the room. Panicking, I chased after him, but he was already gone. I stopped seeing him after that. Maybe what I said to him in anger was too much of a shock, but either way, I was glad that when I woke up, I no longer saw him. But it wasn't the end of our encounters. Oh no, it was just the beginning. I ended up dropping out of high school, but when everyone else was at university, I was still living my neat lifestyle. I tried finding work several times, but everyone knew I was a dropout and a shut-in, so the few jobs I did manage to find never lasted long with my strained relationships. And so, on the night of my 20th birthday, I was sitting in front of my computer with nothing to do. Suddenly, the door to my room opened. Both my parents were at work, so it couldn't be either of them, but the door had definitely opened. Wondering if the lock was broken, I got up from the computer and went to check it, but there was nothing wrong. I sat back down, wondering what on earth had happened. And that was when I saw him. He was standing next to the desk with the computer on it, just looking at me. My mind stopped working. I couldn't understand what was going on. Our eyes were locked, 
and I couldn't look away for fear of what might happen. He stood there in that same spot, with the same pose and same face for about an hour before leaving the room. And that was when I was sure of it. Our time together was about to start again. And as expected, I started seeing him again, but unlike last time, I never saw him in the same spot at the same time. This time, I saw him in different places, at different times, although he still looked exactly the same. When I took a bath, there he was. When I woke up in the morning, there he was lying next to me. Of course, I thought my heart might stop, but it wasn't like some horror movie where he suddenly attacked me. He wasn't a ghost lady with long hair, so I wasn't that scared. And inside, whenever I saw him, I just told myself it was Toa Toa-san, and that was it. But then one day, I noticed something strange. Toa Toa-san's face was starting to change. Bit by bit, it was like anger was being injected into it. I wondered if he was angry at something. But realizing that, I started to become more afraid of running into him. I got my parents to buy me a phone, and after that, I pretty much spent the entire day in bed every day. That way, as long as I didn't wake up with him lying next to me, I'd be fine. And if things went back like last time, I figured I could just yell at him again and get him to go away. At any rate, I ended up spending the next three weeks just lying in bed. There were a few times, like in high school, where I could sense a presence in the room, but I just continued looking at dirty images on my phone and paid it no mind. On the 19th day, my body started to feel strange. It got to the point where I couldn't even get up to use the toilet or to eat. I didn't use my muscles at all, so no wonder. And on top of that, I was afraid of seeing Toa Toa-san in the bath so I hadn't bathed either. I stank. I decided I had to get rid of him. I couldn't let him keep pushing me around like this any longer. On the 20th day, I did my best to make sure I ran into him, and I saw him almost right away. When I woke up, I sensed him in my room. A chance had immediately presented itself. But I could hear a strange noise. It was like something being kicked. I peeked from under the blanket and saw Toa Toa-san kicking a pillar in my room. The wooden pillar didn't budge, but his leg was swollen and covered in blood. Over and over, he continued kicking it for no reason. Afraid, I let out a small gasp and as soon as he heard it, he stopped kicking. Then he turned to look right at me. He kindly lowered his head to my level. He didn't have a face. It was entirely blank. The moment I saw that, I put my head back under the blanket. When I looked again, he was gone. When my parents finally came home and saw blood all over the house, they almost passed out. Thinking I might have murdered someone, they entered my room with the police and... That was when they finally figured out something was going on. Neighbours gathered to see what was happening, and I wasn't sure what they would say if I mentioned Toa Toa-san, but I tried desperately to clear my name. They searched the house, but in the end didn't find anything. The police concluded I must have gone mad, and the blood was from harming myself. And, well, we couldn't really hang around after that, so we ended up moving. Sorry for rambling for so long. Maybe what they said was true and all the middle part of the story really was me losing my mind. That's why I was never able to tell anyone about this. But what I heard about Toa Toa-san, the blank face I saw in the third grade, it was all true. As for the blood, well, these days, I honestly don't know. That's the end of the main story. Now I'm a university student. The reason I'm going now is because my parents begged me with tears in their eyes. We suffered fierce vitriol after what happened at the house that time, so 
I gave in and agreed. I've seen Toa Toa-san only once since then. When I started university, I got the May blues and thought that maybe I'd skip out on school today. I woke up and laid in bed for around an hour when suddenly I felt a presence appear in my room. I knew it was him. I looked around and saw some familiar legs. Toa Toa-san. I didn't feel any resentment or whatever for him after what happened last time. It just felt like I hadn't seen him in a while. And, if anything, I had more positive feelings than bad. I no longer felt like skipping school, so I turned to him and said, I'm going to school now. Ah, he said, and then next thing I knew, he was gone. That was the first and last time I ever heard him speak. I sometimes skipped lectures and even my part-time job after that, but Toa Toa-san never appeared again. And, just recently, I had a chance to meet a friend from back home, an old classmate of mine who was the only one to keep in contact with me, even after I dropped out of school. Anyway, according to him, there was a big fuss back home about Toa Toa-san appearing in some drama. Of course, Toa Toa-san was restricted to our hometown, so there was no way he could have appeared on location in Tokyo. But, well, you may have already realised. Yep, I was the one who freed him. I can never tell my friend this, but Toa Toa-san might be having trouble getting back home too. Although, the city is full of lazy people, so maybe he's busy out there too. After all, what if you go mad after meeting him, like me? Recently, there has been a lot of news about Neats killing their parents and such. I wonder if that has anything to do with him. If I had done just one thing differently, maybe that would have been me too. Next, a man reminisces about the old days at his great-grandmother's funeral, but while there remembers a relative he used to play with. Someone who's not around anymore. But what happened to him, and who was the mysterious figure who always used to hang around them? Find out in... Yanshan. Just the other day, my grandmother passed away. Well, she was my father's grandmother, so technically she was my great-grandmother, and because we lived so far away from each other, we never really saw each other. Still, she was my great-grandmother, so we attended her funeral, and I saw lots of relatives I hadn't seen in a long, long time. Ah, I forgot to tell you a little about me first. Let me write it down simply. I'm a single, 27-year-old businessman. It's probably a little weird for a man my age to have a great-grandmother still alive, huh? This story took place when we all gathered for her funeral. I mentioned that we never really saw her much, but when I first started elementary school, when I was… six? We lived in her house with her for about a month. There were delays with the construction of our new house, which meant it dragged on even after we had to leave our apartment. My great-grandmother lived in the countryside of Fukuoka, and nearby there was a gateball field, some tenements, and lots of fields where you never knew what they were growing. I was a curious kid, so before I started school, every day was like an adventure for me. Anyway, back to her funeral. Because my great-grandmother was just shy of 100, the atmosphere wasn't very sad. Most people were like, wow, she was amazing. It was like a grand send-off, with everyone reminiscing about what she had done during her life. The funeral itself was held at a nearby funeral home, but after that, we all gathered in her house to eat and reminisce about her life. Everyone gathered around her photo albums to talk about the old days. The only memories I had of her were from before I started school, and the photos were full of people I didn't know, so I was kinda bored. Then, someone suddenly shouted, 
Hey, there's S. S was my dad, and I turned back to look at them. He looked just like a little delinquent. I laughed when I saw him wearing a white suit to go to high school. The albums were in order from oldest to newest, so there was my father's high school years, then his coming of age ceremony. This went on until the present. My birth, that time we spent a month living with her, and it was at this point that one photo in particular caught my eye. As I was looking at the photo, I realised something. Nori-chan, who was rather close to my great-grandmother, wasn't at the funeral. Everyone stopped smiling as they looked at the photo of him. Nori-chan always played alone, and apparently the parents of small children who lived nearby were always complaining about him, claiming he was a troublemaker and such. But my great-grandmother was rather open-minded, with a big heart, so she never stopped him from playing alone. On the contrary, if people complained, she just said to them, If you're that worried about it, then keep your children in the house. You see, Nori-chan was 45 years old, so looking in from the outside, seeing a 45-year-old man playing alone like he was just an elementary school kid was no doubt a little weird and creepy. But it was also true that he never bothered anyone. I found it strange that everyone's smiles disappeared when the topic of Nori-chan came up, but just like that, the reception was over, and those who had come from far away were going to spend the night in my great-grandmother's house while everyone who lived nearby was going to go home. I'd been drinking, so I decided to spend the night there. But then M-chan, 35, divorced, who lived nearby, asked me if I wanted to go out for some more drinks, so I agreed. We were blood relatives, although pretty distant ones, but we shared a few common friends, so we generally got on pretty well. M-chan had lived near my great-grandmother ever since she was a child, so I thought I'd take the opportunity to ask her about Nori-chan and what happened to him. She said that because he'd gotten older and there was no one around to care for him, he was staying in a home. I figured everyone felt bad about putting him in a home so they didn't have to care for him, and that was why nobody spoke about it when his photo popped up. I drank with M-chan until 2am, and then we took a taxi back to her house. She let me spend the night there, and because we were both drunk, we passed out right away. When I woke up, thinking it morning, I realised it was still dark. I looked at the time and saw I'd been asleep for less than an hour. I hadn't slept for very long, so how could I feel so refreshed? How odd, I thought, and I closed my eyes to go back to sleep again. But I was now wide awake. I thought maybe if I kept my eyes shut, then eventually I'd fall asleep, but I just didn't feel tired at all. And so, I just lay there listening to the ticking of the clock. I don't know how much time passed, but as I lay there, I suddenly remembered the photos we looked at at my great-grandmother's house. So it is weighing on your mind, I thought to myself. I felt a little scared, so I tried not to think about it too much, but I just couldn't stop thinking about that photo of Nori-chan. Looking back, when I lived at my great-grandmother's house for a month, I remembered playing with him. He would always come over to her house after lunchtime. I often went out to the fields and empty lots to play with him. I could remember that much, but that was it. I woke up after midday with no satisfactory answer, and then I thanked M-chan and went home. Being a Sunday, I decided I'd go visit my parents first. I'd seen them at the funeral the day before, so it wasn't like it had been a long time, but it was my first time back at the house for a while, so I was able to see their dog. Despite being a complete cat person, their dog sure is cute. I kicked back and relaxed for a while, but I still couldn't get Nori-chan out of my head. Hey, do you guys remember Nori-chan? 
I decided to ask my parents. They both remembered him well, and they thought highly of him, so I was surprised when they spoke so openly about their memories of him. When I was little, Naughty Chan took me here and did this, etc, etc. They laughed as they told their stories. But one of those stories suddenly made me remember something, and all at once, I grew afraid. Apparently, when I was six years old, I often told my mother that I played with Naughty Chan and Yan Chan. When she mentioned that name, I suddenly remembered him, but looking back now, there was no way he could have been real. Bad memories bubbled up within me. Whenever I played with Naughty Chan, Yan Shan was pretty much always there as well. The memories are a little vague, but I think probably 80% of the time we were together, Yan Shan was there too. At least, that's how it feels. Whenever Naughty Chan came to my great grandmother's house before lunch, she always prepared something for the two of us to eat, but never for Yan Shan. When the two of us ate, Yan Shan would just sit behind Naughty Chan with one knee up. My great grandmother never spoke to him, nor did she make eye contact with him. And looking back on it, I never spoke to him either. I just remembered Naughty Chan always going, Yan Chan, Yan Chan. And they were good friends, so they were always together. Yan Shan always wore trousers that were like school ones, but he never wore a shirt. Unlike Naughty Chan, his hair was pitch black and shaved. I think he was probably around 30 or so. I don't know. I don't know how Naughty Chan and Yan Chan communicated, but sometimes Naughty Chan would giggle happily after some sort of exchange. I didn't know what was going on, but because he burst out laughing, I did too. I remember that Yan Shan never made a fuss and always had a serious look on his face. Then one day, this happened. Naughty Chan came to my great-grandmother's house like always to get me. On this day, he was alone, and he said that we were going to pick up Yan Chan. There was a candy store about a 30-minute walk from her house, and they had a fighting game you could play twice for just 100 yen. On the way to pick up Yan Chan, we passed by this store. As soon as I looked at the arcade machine, Naughty Chan said we should play. We forgot about Yan Shan and put all our money into the game. We played games in the candy store and then played in the park across the road from it. Before we knew it, it was evening and time to go home. It was on the way back that I remembered we were supposed to pick up Yan Shan. Worried, I asked Naughty Chan if it would be okay that we didn't pick him up. Yet, he said that Yan Shan had been with us since earlier. But he most definitely wasn't, and if he was there, then he should have said hello, I thought, annoyed. I had no other memories of Yan Shan other than that. His existence was simply muttering things to Naughty Chan and making him laugh once in a while. Getting back to the story. I had dinner at my parents' house that day, and then went home. As soon as I got back, I called M Chan and asked her if she knew about Yan Shan. She said she didn't, but she kept asking me why I wanted to know, so I told her what I just wrote above. I'll look into it, she said casually, seeming satisfied with my response, and then she hung up. Three days after that, last night, she called me. I felt my mood drop as I remembered Naughty Chan and Yan Shan again, but I answered. Surprisingly, she spoke in a cheerful voice, so I was relieved. This is what she told me that she uncovered. M Chan's father was close to Naughty Chan's age, and he knew him from high school. Naughty Chan was healthy until around 20 or so, when he had an accident at work. He was a civil engineer and was hospitalised. There, he kind of lost his mind. The cause of his accident was unknown, and all they knew was that the crane straps holding a large steel plate broke, 
and it landed on him. So he was hospitalised with one leg suffering a compound fracture. Basically, the leg was nearly entirely cut off. He then developed a speech impediment while in the hospital, and apparently there was another patient in the same room as him that he called Yanshan. After being discharged from the hospital, Noddy Chan's intellectual disability continued to worsen. He would wander around alone, talking and laughing to himself. And before the accident, he was always alone, with no friends. I felt like I understood what happened with Noddy Chan, but I still didn't know anything about Yan Shan, other than the fact that they met while in the hospital. And when I was six years old, close to 25 years or so must have passed since Noddy Chan's accident. Did that mean that Noddy Chan had been playing alongside Yan Shan for close to 25 years? Just thinking about it gave me goosebumps. The extent of Noddy Chan's leg injury must have been terrible, but it was odd that his mental state continued to get worse after that. I was unable to get any further information from M Chan about Yan Shan though, which was fine because honestly I was scared and didn't want to know. I just wanted to forget about everything as quickly as possible. Apparently Noddy Chan still mentions the name Yan Shan at the home he's in, but he's mostly unable to speak these days. I also heard that when Noddy Chan had his accident, there was someone who basically crushed their skull in a bike accident, who was admitted at the same time. He was put in the same room as Noddy Chan, but he died three days later. That person's name was Yamane-san, and apparently his mother introduced herself to one of Noddy Chan's friends there. Supposing that Yan Shan was actually Yamane-san. Just thinking about it makes me sick to my stomach and more than a little terrified, so I don't want to push the idea any further. Finally this week, some friends visit an abandoned building and decide to play a game. A game that is supposed to allow you to find spirits more easily. Will they succeed and do they even want to? Find out in Blindfolded Demon. Recently I caught up with some friends and we sat around telling scary stories. One of them really stood out to me so let me share it. I'm not that good at writing and it happened a week ago so I may have forgotten or slightly changed some parts so please forgive me. A group of four university friends decided to go out and do a test of courage towards the end of summer. They thought it would be boring to visit a cemetery or something like that, so instead they decided to see if there were any local ghost spots. They discovered a famous abandoned building about a three hour drive away, so they decided to go there. They got there at 11pm or so, but then the guy who suggested they go there in the first place, T said, Hey, I found an interesting story. He decided to tell them about it before they went in, and it turned out the interesting story he'd heard was an easy method to run into ghosts. This method was called the blindfolded demon, and it was said to be quite effective, despite the fact it didn't need much preparation. Here's a simple explanation for how you can carry it out. First, two or more people gather in a spot where spirits are likely to appear. Then, everyone holds hands and one person is blindfolded. After this, nobody is to let go of anyone's hand. The blindfolded person then screams, Oni-san, where are you? Answer me! Then everyone holds their breath and listens closely. If nobody hears anything, then try calling out again or change to a different spot. If the blindfolded person hears a sound or a voice, then they must head in that direction. It's dangerous because of the blindfold, so someone should help them. 
If they can't hear the voice anywhere or don't know which way to go, they should call out again. And keep repeating this over and over until you see the ghost. According to T, humans get most of their information, like 80% or something, from what they see. And you often hear about how people who can't see have a better sense of smell or hearing, so the same worked for psychic senses as well. I think it's actually pretty common in scary stories that people who can't see sense ghosts easier than other people. And so, this blindfolded demon method was a way of getting close to that state and making it easier to see spirits. When the other three heard his story, they weren't very enthusiastic about trying. They thought it was more than enough to just explore the abandoned building, have a few scares, and then go home. But T kept pressuring them. Come on, we drove all this way. If we don't at least try, then it's just going to be boring. And so, reluctantly, the three agreed. As soon as they went inside, T held hands with one of his friends and they put a black blindfold on him. Then he shouted the designated words. Everything fell silent and everyone held their breath, waiting for T to react. Nobody said a thing, but then, after maybe 20 or 30 seconds had passed, one of them finally turned to T. Can you hear anything? They asked nervously. T didn't respond immediately, but after a short pause said with a small smile, All I can hear are insects. That broke the tension and everyone relaxed. Ha oh man, I knew it. Yeah, there was no way. Everyone laughed and joked around. They then continued around the building and called out in different places, but they didn't hear anything, and the longer it went on, the less nervous they got and the funnier they found it. But that all changed once they reached a long corridor. I can hear something, T whispered, and everyone stopped in their tracks. You're joking, right? His friend said, trembling and trying to make light of the situation but T's expression remained serious. It's like something on the wind. Can't you hear it? Like, hoo, hoo. The three friends listened closely, but they couldn't hear anything. T pointed to the end of the corridor. I think it's coming from over there, he said. And so, reluctantly, they continued. I think I can hear it above us, T said once they reached the end. You can't see, right? The friend holding his hand asked. The pair standing behind them wondered what that meant, and when they looked ahead, they saw a staircase. Now they were starting to feel afraid. Really afraid. But T felt differently. When they told him there were stairs, he got excited and started heading up them alone. His friends panicked and tried to pull him back down, but he got angry and yelled at them. They insisted they should leave now, but T wanted to continue and wouldn't listen. After a few minutes of back and forth and arguing, T suddenly stopped and looked surprised. Quiet, he said, and everyone fell silent. I don't hear it anymore. He suddenly started screaming again and then listening for a response. The air hung much heavier than the first time they tried, and after 30 seconds or so, T sighed. <sighs> it's no good. I can't hear anything. The tension was immediately broken and everyone sighed. Come on, let's go home, they said. T seemed to think it over first before replying but then he agreed. You're right, let's go home. The other three looked at each other in confusion for a moment, but then they quickly understood and they rushed to leave the building. They reached the car without incident, relieved. The ride home was also uneventful, and if matters ended there, it would have been nothing more than a simple summer memory. 
but it didn't. Several days later, on the first Sunday after the summer holidays ended, one of the friends who visited that building was hanging out at home. It was his day off and he didn't have anything to do, so he slept until past noon, not getting out of bed until 1pm. At any rate, he was bored, so he decided to call T to see if he wanted to do something. When T answered the phone, he was rather worked up over something. His friend asked him what was going on, but he could hardly believe his answer. Actually, I'm back at that building we visited the other day, he said. His friend could hardly believe his ears, but even more shockingly, T was apparently there alone. Why are you there by yourself? he asked. Well, apparently, the blindfolded demon ritual is actually supposed to be carried out alone, he said. The spirits are more likely to make contact if you're by yourself, and it's harder to detect spirits if there are living people around you. But no matter how you looked at it, wandering around an abandoned building by yourself in a blindfold was just too dangerous. His friend tried to get him to stop. Look, I'll be there soon, he said, and then hung up the phone. T would be in danger if they didn't do something, so he called up the same friends so they could head back to that building together. One of those friends refused, however, as it was too sudden. Luckily, they were able to find someone else, so the three of them then made their way over. It was around 2pm when they left, and just after five when they got there. The sun was beginning to set. With the abandoned building standing right before them, honestly, the three of them wanted to go right back home. But they summoned up the courage to go inside. They had to find T before the sun went down and he potentially hurt himself. To make a long story short, it turned out that T wasn't even in the building, but outside it. They found him beneath an open window on the third floor with the door unnaturally open. He probably fell from up there. He was limp when they found him, but it wasn't that great of a height, so he was just covered in bruises and suffered a broken arm that would heal entirely in two or so months. When they asked T about it later, he said he had no memories of what happened after he entered the building. As is often the case with these types of stories, the next thing he knew, he woke up, and he was in a hospital bed. Man, what an idiot I am for jumping out that window too, T joked with his friends who came to see him, but nobody laughed. After all, the area right in front of where they found T was full of graves, like a graveyard. Maybe it was them who called to him. A massive thank you and shout out to this week's Kami Tier members, Christina and S Dash. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to check out Koabana Volume 12, out on Amazon right now, and check out our newly revamped merchandise store at koabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Koabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on koabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Kowabana Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now. <laughs>